to the show that never ends. We are back here with a live stream. We have Matthew Pose and James Larson, and we're going to do a four-speaker powered monitor shootout. How are you guys doing, Matt, James? We're good. good. We're excited to do this. We've been putting it off for a while because we had to make sure all the reviews got published, but we've actually been sitting on these speakers for a while listening to them, and we're really excited to share what we found. And in reality, I didn't publish all the reviews yet. We still have the RBH PM8s that are on deck. I think I published, James, did I publish all the other three prior? Yes, yes. Okay, so the RBH review will be publishing soon. But we might as well give our fellow YouTubers the scoop on all these different products in case they don't want to read or if they want to go back and read it later. And just so you guys know, if you're a patron at patreon.com slash audiohawks, I'm putting the slide presentation there. So it's got a lot of great information here. You guys can reference it. You can look back later when you watch this video, and then we're going to cut, chop this video up into different segments for each speaker because we want to go over the pros and cons of each speaker. So, James, why don't you tell us the four speakers that are in this shootout and why you chose to review these four particular products, even at even because they're at different price points? Okay. Um, I, I really wanted to do, uh, review some uh, powered monitors because, like, there are some really big advantages to powered monitors. Um, our, our studio monitors, are just, it's just as pure high fidelity loudspeakers. And, uh, and I just reached out to a whole bunch of companies um, and asked them, Did you, do you want AudioHawks to re you know, have a review of our speakers? And um, the, the reason why we have the speakers that we did, because those are the manufacturers that said, yes, we do. A lot of them didn't, you know, they weren't interested in getting the, you know, a, a, a review with measurements, or they, or it was just hard to get a hold of them. We could only get a hold of some publicist who didn't, you know, couldn't work things out with a manufacturer, or is always something. But these were the guys we were able to get in touch with, and um, they were very willing to send us their speakers. So that's that's okay. why we have these particular speakers. Yeah, well, I, I know that I, I know there are I'm sorry, Matt. Um there are times where you you contact the manufacturer and they know because we do measurements that sometimes they fear having their products looked at in an objective way. So it speaks volumes when a company um is willing to stand up to our scrutiny and let us do the measurements of their speakers and let us kind of show our audience what they're all about. And there is there's a history here to what James is getting at. So for as long as I've known him. James has had this this thought that probably for a given amount of money, you could get a better speaker from some of the, not all, but from some of these studio monitor companies for that amount of money than you could in a home speaker, a traditional home speaker in terms of the accuracy. Uh, and we were curious because the problem was we've we've heard some of these studio monitors before, but not necessarily in our homes being used in the same way that we would typical domestic speakers. So... The thought was, you know, if your budget is four or $500 for a pair of speakers, can you actually do better with a pair of studio monitors from one of these brands than you would if you were to buy an equal priced pair of speakers from the typical name brands that we're all used to? And uh, we knew that some were probably pretty good, including one of the ones that we went after, which was the Kali. So when James says these are the ones that responded... That's true to a point. Not everybody we re reached out to is willing to, to let us do these reviews. But we did contact some of these companies for a reason, which was that we had good reason to believe that they were an exceptional value. And I think people will be interested to see what we did, in fact, find. All right. So why don't you get the slide presentation on up on your uh, screen? We could share this and we could kind of show people um, the four products in question, the measurements and all that stuff. And you could just kind of walk us through. And I am going to share your screen. So you have you have the screen now, Matt. All right. So hopefully everybody can see this. This is the Pro Monitor Roundup. And do you want to? I, I know you kind of went through, but do you want to quickly just mention what these are? Um, sure. The, um, going from um, left to right. I don't know if that actually works left to right when it's going on YouTube, but yep. Um, it might be flipping. I think it's right. Yeah. All right. Well, from my from my um, screen, left to right is the the PreSonus uh on the on the left and then in the, in the middle left is the atom audio um, the one with that like kind of glossy sheen right next to that is the rbh pm8 and next to that on the far right is the cali audio lp-8 
And I should mention in the picture, it looks like these are all the same size. They're not the same size. They're not the same size. No, the RBHs are actually by far the biggest and heaviest. We have them them. here and we'll show you them. So, yeah. Right. Well, they also have an eight inch woofer, and I think the other models are all six and a half. They're all eight inch except for the Atom Audio. I think that one's a six and a half. Oh, okay. All right, so let's get into the Kali. So I we had actually done a system before on the LP6 uh, because I had heard it, and even though it had some imperfections, I thought they were really good. But I'd never measured them, and I'd never seen measurements. So, so what's James. the price on these now? These are two hundred dollars uh, each. Or yeah, they, they 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 had a price cut recently. Um, they're two hundred dollars each, so four hundred a pair. It's you know really affordable. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, we did a, we did a written review on these recently. We published them, and we have a. Uh, I'll put some buy now links underneath to Amazon, so you guys can find these products if any of them are interesting to you. Okay, I guess we should go over these um, measurements. Okay, so, well, let's go over the specs for the LP8 first. I mean, you, you can see the measurements, but th- this is a, um, as Matt said, it has an 8-inch woofer, a waveguide-loaded dome tweeter. Um, and there's a lot uh, the review, There's a lot in the review of a lot of the design of the speaker. These are designed to be, like, as good as they can make a speaker for, for the cost. And uh, at Cali Audio, and, and for those who don't know, Cali Audio, the, the principal engineer of the speakers, and I think some of the other staff, they came from JBL's pro division. These are the guys. I know uh, Charles Sprinkle is the, like the, the main engineer of these, and he made the a lot of speakers for JBL, including the LSR 300s. They're very popular. I think they're the most popular, the hot, hottest selling studio monitor there is. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, But they decided... For whatever reason, um, they they could do better on their own, and so they they uh, went off to form Cali Audio, and um, to make the best loudspeakers they could for the cost. And they, I think, with the LPH, they have done an amazing job with these speakers. Um, they're just okay. That that's a two hundred dollar speaker. Look how flat that response is. Across, now let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about the response curves here, because people may not know. The dip that you're seeing at about 600 hertz is that real or is that an anomaly? Maybe uh, like like a floor bounce or something like that's that. That's real. That's it's real. It's probably a re- like a port resonance or something. It's yeah. a port, re- but it's it's a high Q port resonance, so you can ignore that. It's not going to sound like much. It's not going to really affect the sound. Um, as as we've discussed before, um, the resonances which are, are more audible are the ones which are much broader. That's not that broad of a resonance. It's it's a high Q resonance. So if, if that was like a big if they're if the response is more wavy, right? Right. That's that's what to look at. But if there's like jag jagged little dips or, or peaks, especially dips, right? It's not all that audible. So that's you that's can't not really hear. Problem. Yeah, you can't really hear the dips. You hear the peaks, if, especially if they're high Q peaks. You hear that more than you would hear a dip. Well, if, right? if, if they're if they're low Q peaks, yeah, and so. Yeah, very anything that's got a very sharp or fine shape to it like that tends to not be overly audible. And you know, it's an inexpensive speaker, and there. So yes, there does appear to be. A little resonance there. It's not perfect, but for for the cost, that is. It's about as good as it gets. It's as good as it gets. Yeah, there's nothing. I mean, you can't buy a passive speaker with that kind of response. That's how good. Now the rise, the rise above 10 kilohertz, is that because of the 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 measurement mic position relative to the tweeter? No, that's waveguide. It's it's a waveguide. Well, it's the tweeter and waveguide together, and it's it's not uncommon for that to show up and for people to leave it in the response because you'll notice that the tweeter tends to beam. So you see that in the dotted line directivity index, how the line suddenly starts to take off, uh, going going much higher. That's because that tweeter, its dispersion isn't being well controlled above uh, about 12 kilohertz. And so you leave it in there because on average, the response is actually pretty flat. And it's so high that you can't really hear that peak all that much. Yeah, you, you could knock it out if you really were bothered by it, but you probably can't hear that. You can't. There's nothing above 10 kilohertz that, that really matters. I mean, if, if that was really high, yeah, you could hear it. But that's not a big deal. That, that sort of peak at, at, at that frequency range, there's not much content up there. And plus, a lot of people are really, they don't hear well in that range anyway, especially like, Older guys, right? Yeah. They just yep. don't hear. Their hearing is shocked, like above like 15 kilohertz. Or they're not hearing most of that, so that's not it's not a big deal. These these speakers, they sound really good. They measure really well, and they sound like they measure, which is really good. And and it's incredible for a two hundred dollar or four hundred dollar a pair of speaker to to be this well controlled. It's not just the it's not just the um. 
the linearity that we're seeing here is the uh, the dynamic range. These can get really loud, and they don't break up. They don't run into a lot of distortion. They 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 stay can play clean at very loud levels. It like it's like a miracle for two hundred. There is no passive passive speaker that can challenge these. That can challenge the kind of like performance this has. For, for the money, there's just, I can't think of anything out there. Matt, can you? No, I mean, if you consider that, so forget the fact that these are powered, because I mean, essentially this is a passive, it's not a passive speaker, but essentially think of it as a passive speaker with an amplifier, which normally for home audio, that means buying a receiver and passive speakers. This has got all that kind of together in one. So forget that for a moment, just think of it as a $400 pair of speakers. There's nothing for $400 a pair that we've ever seen or measured that is even close to as good as this is. So this is by far the best measuring speaker that we've ever seen. And to boot, it's got a good amplifier. I mean, it's not like a great amplifier, but it's got a good enough amplifier built into it. And part of why it does measure so good is that because it's active, it's got DSP built in to correct the response. But then it's not just that. I mean, you can't get a response this good just on DSP alone. It's also the waveguide and the way that the drivers were integrated. Yeah. It's, now, it's, now, from a application standpoint, um, does it have a sub out? Like, can we hook up a subwoofer to this? It doesn't. Um, so what you would have to do is probably, so you could use this with a home theater receiver and just use the preamp outputs. You could use um, a home theater processor, which has balanced outputs, and then that would give you the sub out and everything. Um, or you could use an external controller. So like I have a little inexpensive monitor controller, and you can plug these into that, and then that, that usually also gives you an ability to do a sub out and to integrate that which would be a good idea. I mean, they have good bass on their own with the 8-inch drivers, but you can certainly do better with a separate sub. I okay. listen to them both ways. I don't know. Did you add a sub when you listen to them? I, I, I think I did it, yeah. Yeah, so they so it's not you know it's not quite the same when I say it has a built-in receiver. It's not quite that good. Why don't you show us, if, why don't you grab, grab the speaker and just show us what it looks like? Yeah, that's like. behind you, Matt. Um, yeah, I don't know what you guys can see. Can I just see? Gene, do you see us on your screen? Yeah, I see you. Yep. <laughs> yeah, look at that guy. It's not a small speaker. Right? Damn, that is, that's bigger than I expected. That's what she said. Well, it's, a, <laughs> it's an 8-inch speaker, and you can see the waveguide and the, and the mid-bass driver, the port on the bottom, and then on the back of it. Um, so it's actually not that heavy for what it is. I mean, I'm struggling because I'm a wimp. But Where's the it's... port? I don't see the port because I think your name's blocking it. Oh, it's on the front, the port? It's, it's on the front It's below. on the front bottom. So oh, you... okay. I got you. Yeah. So this is about the size of a JBL L308. It's a little bigger. Okay. It's, it's probably on par with Probably the size, roughly the size but it, it is a little bigger. Um, this is it's not a small speaker, but it's yeah, it, it's just it's a really good speaker. You know? But it, yeah, so I mean, I think the key thing here is the JBLs are good too. But what this does that's better than the JBLs is it plays quite a bit louder. I mean, it's, I I think it's about six decibels louder. This is loud enough that in a typical sized room they would work fine for home theater use which is not true of a lot of inexpensive studio monitors wait you're saying this will play louder than a jbl l308 yeah i think so i, I think wow. by about six yeah. decibels yeah we, yeah I, I believe so and it's like and i don't think the jbl 308 would measure as well as this does i mean i J jbls are really good right the lsrs are very yeah. very good speakers for the money but i don't think that they have this kind of like um neutrality or accuracy I well, we're going to have to get in a pair because people have been asking for us to review them. So I'll contact JBL. Yeah, let's, let's challenge JBL. Let's, let's yeah. Bring, yeah. bring it, JBL. They, got, they, got they have this. a Mark. JBL has a Mark II, and I know they've made improvements on that model. So Yeah, we've heard stories yeah. that there may have been some cheapening, too. So it'd be good to get them in and measure and see how they compare with this. I mean, my guess is it's going to do maybe some things better and some things worse. But I know Charles Sprinkle had said in the past one of his main goals here was to beat the JBL in terms of output and to get a better measured response. And I'll, I, I, we don't have the JBL to compare. I can just say this is a very good measured response for the price, and they do play very, very loud, unusually loud for a studio monitor of this price. Okay. Do you have anything more on the slides for this, or are we going to move on to the next speaker? No, we do have. So that's, that's so, so that people can see what okay. they were kind of getting out of the other graphs. This is the horizontal response. So just notice how consistent it is. I mean, this is unusually it's consistent. Yeah, it's, it's unusually smooth. Smooth off axis all the way down to that's the ninety-five degrees, right? That's more than a right angle off the off the on axis response, right? And it's just it's just nice and, and consistent all the way off and the entire front hemisphere of the speaker. So somebody put this up, and I was it's a good question. If they have DSP, why didn't they fix that null that we saw, even though it may, it may not you, be audible? You can't fix the, if you're talking about the dip uh, from port resonance, you can't fix a port resonance with DSP. It, here, because of the smoothing that gets applied, it looks like 
the shape of it is just that dip that you see. In reality, it's essentially almost infinitely deep. So you'd just be right. pouring power into a black hole. So, so can someone open up this box and, and maybe um, put more sound foam or maybe um, dampen the port itself to reduce that resonance? Or is it so, a function of the diameter and length of the port? Sometimes James and I think we're smarter than speaker designers and we get into these ideas yeah. and then we get into trying to test some of the stuff and we find it's never as simple as we thought it was. So I'll just say you can try it. I would not be shocked if it doesn't work. It probably actually would require a port redesign, probably identifying the specific cause of the resonance in the port and then redesigning the port to avoid it. Again, this is not something th th this is not a big deal. You can't hear that. Right. You, yeah. You'd have to, you'd have to like be running a sine wave th sweep through that area and listening for that and to, to be able to hear it. But you would never hear it on like complex, real content, you know, like, like music or a movie or something. You wouldn't hear that. And that's like, okay. it's a mild, it's a mild flaw compared to what most, speakers have at this price point it's it's nothing yeah and port resonances are actually pretty common we see them in a lot of inexpensive speakers again the the, the real trick would be redesigning the port and i think it's, it's good enough it's really good yeah yeah, yeah. i mean given that we go over the, the pros and you go over the pros and cons now yeah. of the speaker so um yeah, well james you reviewed it you go ahead and go through the pros. <laughs> okay um the pros let's see what i had uh i mean like as you said ex very accurate incredibly accurate for um the price uh, the directivity control, I mean, uh, you can listen to these at like any angle and it's going to, it's not going to change the, the character of the sound much. And also it, of course the, there's the, um, the acoustic advantages that has in room in a, like a normal room. There's no weirdness off axis that you're going to hear because everything off axis sounds like the on axis response. So it's all, it's all good there. Dynamic range, as we said, is, is, is just, excellent for the for the cost and we didn't see this on those graphs but on the review you can see that it the base extension is solid down to 40 hertz so like it's just it's just such a good speaker for the money um the cons are and we, we find this on a lot of monitors like the jbls and, and the other monitors we have in our review most of them is like there is a hiss like a like a well, more like a white noise not quite a hiss like a, a soft white noise that these have when they're on it's, it's, it's all the time it's there you can't really get rid of it or anything but um it, it's kind of a consequence of the kind of the, the, the very wide dynamic ranges they have you can hear it it's audible in the near field and not so much in the far field but it, like if you're looking for near field monitors and if you want dead silence right these don't do that so yeah. when you say near field, just so the audience knows, near field, you're talking about maybe a few feet, maybe three yeah. or four feet away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like a desktop yeah. speaker. Yeah, and I used them on my desktop for a while. I mean, the hiss is there, and it's 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 a little annoying. Um, and I think it is worse on this one than some of the others. It's part of how they were able to allow them to play so loud. But when you set them up in a room, like mm -hmm. when I put them in my theater and Can't set them up them. and sat back you know, 10 feet from them, I didn't notice it nearly as much to the point that as soon as I started listening to music or watching movies, I didn't hear it at all. Yeah. But used on my desk at three, four feet, yeah, it was audible. It, it's audible. Okay. It's so and, soft, And though. to be honest with you, the, a speaker this large, I don't think too many people are going to be sticking on a desk three or four feet away. I would think <laughs> that this be, I mean, unless, you know, unless you have a lot of desk space, Yeah. I guess... Be caution about it. Uh, if you're in a really quiet room, if you're in an acoustically controlled room with a low noise floor you're, and you're only sitting three or four feet away, this might not be the ideal speaker. But, but then, then again, Gene, in a room like that, you're probably, you have more of a budget than $200 for a, a speaker monitor. Exactly. You're, you're, you're spending yeah. thousands, you know, in, in yeah. a, that, that sort of condition. But, you know, it's sad. You... Somebody wrote this here just to back up what you guys are saying. We can't see it because of our, we're, we're looking yeah. at the oh, slideshow. Oh, sorry, I forgot. What does he say? You can read it to us. It says, I returned the Cali speakers because of the hiss. I just couldn't take it in the near field. Again, this is a near field problem. So if you're sitting further away from the speaker in a home theater environment or like Matt was saying, or if it's in a, a family room or something, it's probably not going to be an issue. It's only uh, when you're really again, close to the Again, speaker. Gene, I would say that a lot of speakers have that. A lot of these monitors have that. Almost all of them, except for the ones we're going to talk about next. Yeah. They all had it and, and a lot more than these do besides... Also, one, one more thing about the cons is uh, about the, the LPH I wanted to mention was that... You said they're aggressive looking. Yeah, they're, they, they don't look... They're not like... If you were to put, if you put them in like a nice like a living room or something with like very you know, like careful decor, it wouldn't really fit. 
you know, they, they're, they're very, they're aggressive. Like they're industrial looking, aggressive looking. If you like, if you like have a gaming setup or something, they'd fit in just right there. Um, but yeah, you know, they, they, they don't have nice, they're veneers. not that elegant looking. Yeah, just they're not that. a pretty speaker, but you know, that was the whole point. We weren't trying to find pretty speakers that sounded really good. We just wanted, good we wanted sound. to find the best sound for the least money. And I think this is probably so it sounds like what you guys are saying based on, especially James, because James, you almost never uh, give compliments. You're a hard person to give compliments to, to be honest. You're tough on, on speakers. Um, you're saying that this is just about the best value in terms of ac accuracy in a monitor, and it's almost impossible to get this in a passive design for four hundred dollars a pair. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'll, I'll, I would say that. Yeah, you can't. And, and you know, I, and one more thing, I was like, you know, on our on our on our forums and in other places, people are like, they have a budget. They're, they're saying, what what kind of home theater should I get, right? And now everybody, you know, everybody always says, what kind of AVR should I get? What speakers should I pair them with? Well, I'm saying. What you can get, you can get that um, was that, the Outlaw Model Nine Seven Six, was it called the the their yeah, processor? The, the yeah, the processor. You can yeah. get that and, and and a whole like almost like what two hundred like a seven a seven speaker Cali audio setup for two thousand dollars, and and yeah. there's nothing that can compare to that that you can get with an AVR and some passive speakers. Nothing can compare to that, you know. It's true. Yeah, you, you that, that would be a really, really killer system for the money. You'd probably be well in excess of I'd say ten, fifteen thousand dollars before you get back to a similar performance level with typical home speakers. Yeah, and... a AVRs and passive speakers they should they should start to go away now, right? When we <laughs> we look at what these speakers are, all these speakers are doing right. It's time for back passive speakers to like almost like I don't want to say pack their bags. There's a lot of room for them, and there's a lot there are advantages to passive speakers, and we we've, we've talked about this before, but like um. It, it's time to start considering, you know, active speakers with with just our processors instead of AVRs. Yeah, no, it's that we could do a whole other video and an yeah, article on I know. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we should, well, let's we're, let's we're, get on the personas here. And so yeah, so we're wrapped up with the Cali. Why don't we talk about the next speaker, uh, the contender that you guys um, well, have in this shootout? It looked very similar to the Cali. I think we both had high hopes for it, and in the end of the day, I think it did some things better and some things worse. Yeah, um, the so PreSonos Eris E8 XT. That's quite a mouthful. It is. Yeah, yeah I is. won't remember that name again. So here, if you look at these measurements, you can see they're they're not as good, but they're still pretty good. They're they're really good. But, yeah. Now, how much are these speakers a pair? These are like two hundred and fifty six each. So like five hundred a, a pair basically. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, more. they're a little more money. So you'll see that you know they don't have that, that might also be a port resonance. There's something at a similar frequency, but now it's a sure peak it's a instead of a resonance. dip. Yeah, you can mm -hmm. see way up in the treble range, starting actually lower though, more like around eight kilohertz. You see some directivity issues. It's that's not ideal, but it's high enough. It's probably not particularly audible. Otherwise, it's very flat. It's very flat. It's a neutral. And, and you know what? If you put these side by side with the Callies, like like we we did. There, it, it sounds a lot alike. They, they, just there's not a lot of big difference in the sound. So like, they, these are very accurate. This is also a very accurate response. These are these are they're accurate monitors. This is like, this is an accurate loudspeaker. If you wanted to to mix like okay like like we like I I probably should, we should have said before that we are looking at studio monitors in the context of home audio, and that's why I should stress. So like, how good do these sound for recreational listening as opposed to professional work right these are good enough for professional work i think that re that response is is accurate enough for professional professional work and an, an accurate response also sounds good it also happens to sound good so these are just fine for recreational listening too they sound really really good no yeah, will it, these play as loud as the callies or do they, you think they're not as dynamic? i don't think people would be unhappy with them but they don't play as loud as the callies but I don't think they quite play as loud. They do have a more powerful amplifier, but it's a class A B amplifier, whereas the Callies have a class D amplifier. So um, it, it's not not as efficient. I think there's things that they do in the gain. It's it, it's not it wouldn't quite get have the dynamic range, but these do get loud. Most people are going to be perfectly happy with as loud as these can get. Yeah. Now the one big so, advantage of the class A B amp though is what. Is well, the class, ABM, the, the class ABMs tend to not be as hissy, too, because then probably it's right. probably the so SMP. This SMP was the only studio monitor we had that basically is dead quiet. 
I mean, it's, it's so we need to we need to address this real quick. Someone's asking why only show measurements down to 250 hertz. Uh, Matt, why don't you give a quick explanation why we do that? Oh, uh, it's the technique that uh, James used to measure these. So we measure these up on a pole outside, up on a post, basically about what, six feet in the air, something like that. Seven. Feet. Seven feet in the air. And so what happens is, is there's a certain point where the sound uh, wave will hit the ground and then hit the mic and it, it causes an inaccuracy. So what we do is we window out the first reflection, which is that reflection off the ground. So what we're showing you is the only portion of the frequency response which is fully accurate, because once you've windowed out that reflection, you've lost a significant amount of resolution in the low frequencies. Now, I use a technique that lets you kind of restore it, um, but James's view is, you know, and it, he's not wrong in this view. Who cares? The bass response at the end of the day is highly, highly dependent on the room. And so the measurement you get in free space doesn't tell you a whole lot about what the speaker's actual bass response will be like in a room. So um, what we're showing you, though, so, so below 200 hertz, you're not going to see any directivity issues. So James is showing you what you need to know in order to, to really understand how good a speaker is. Well, also, I mean, you, you do you need to know like how the bass, like, you know, if let's say there's any like elevation of the bass and, and, it, and I measure that too, but we use ground plane measurements to capture the bass response. So like if, if you want to see the bass response of these speakers that those measurements are up there, they're separate because I use a separate technique to capture them. Yeah, guys, don't... we have a written we have a written review of every one of these products on audioholics.com and all the measurements are there. This is just a general overview on YouTube. Yeah, so you can see the base response, but I didn't put them in the slideshow, but you'd, you'd have to go to the review to see them. Um, and and the, the, the Presonus and the Cali speakers both have very neutral base. It's flat. It's as flat as the rest of this um, re response that you're seeing. So, like... Um, you know, if I thought there was like something you should see there, I I'd post it on this slideshow. But there, it's it's as good as everything else. And these are, these are flat. I just a bit below forty hertz actually. So these have really good extension. Yeah. These have really good bass extension. They're, yeah, again, they're, they're they're big speakers. Do we want to show them? Yeah. Why don't you grab it? Yeah. Let's turn your side. I have yeah. I have this here. Um. Let, let me get the, these things. So are they? Bigger than the Callies or about the same size? Same size. Same size. I think it's it, they they're slightly wider, but they're otherwise an almost identical oh, geez, speaker. They're heavier though. They're heavier because they're class A B. And I to be honest, so the Callies are the best measuring speaker that for the money that we've seen. But Damn, um, they're nice. not made well, to be completely honest. They're the build quality is definitely worse. This is a better build quality. The finish quality right. is better. Yeah, it, it looks nicer too. I think. What's the driver like... material? What's the cone material on that woofer? Is it like a fiberglass or what is it? I'm not sure what it is. I Something think it's woven. like a, like a, yeah, a weave. Uh... Nice. Now, do these have a subwoofer output, or are we going to find a common uh, pattern here where these don't? I have I think sub they outs? all just don't. They all just have a quarter inch and XLR, something like that. Or they, this has an RCA, a quarter inch and an XLR input, but no output, right? The, yeah. These what what these do have is they have um. They have high pass filters, but you can activate a high pass filter, so you can oh, make perfect. it very easy yeah. to add a, a, a sub in. You can almost have like a kind of a crude base management, but you could you could add a, a sub in. You could low pass the the sub with like 80 hertz. And, and the, this has a high pass filter of uh, 100 hertz or 8, 80 hertz, whatever you want to set it to. So you could set the sub to to that same frequency, and so you could blend a sub well with this without you know. I mean, you could do it better with an outboard processor, but you can do it pretty good with just what's on board the speaker itself. Okay. And, you know, again, kind of thinking of it from the standpoint of what's the best way to get the best sound for the least money, there are some really good measuring. In fact, uh, one of the better ones right now is, uh, you just picked up one, the uh, Motu sound interfaces. So you can use those as essentially like studio monitor controllers uh, connected to your computer. They act basically like a USB DAC. They've just came out with a new series. I forget the models now, but they're cheap. M2 I mean, and M4. Yeah, so like you could get an M2, you know, a pair of either of these monitors and a subwoofer, plug it all into that system and use it to control it, and you'd be good to go. And that would be actually a very high-resolution system. I would say for that much money, you couldn't touch it with any typical home audio equipment. Yeah, like there's no way, like, uh, like a passive speaker system, there's just no way to... Get well, that kind of performance. I mean, well, the receivers could. don't have DACs that are as good. None of it's going to measure as good. But here, let's, we're going to get off track here. So just yeah, looking yeah. at this, you can again see very flat response. It's very consistent as you move off axis. There's a couple of issues with this one that the uh, Kali's didn't have, which is why we said the Kali's measure better. So if you look especially up above 8 kilohertz, the treble isn't quite as consistent as you move off axis. But it's minor stuff that I it, wouldn't think really you could hear. It's really good, though. It's still very, it very is, It good. is, yeah. 
Um, and then this one doesn't have a hissing problem. So for those who are really bothered by that, you know, this is definitely a better speaker in that regard. So I guess we can go over the pros and cons of this. Um, we kind of said all this already. Yeah, we kind of yeah. said, like, it's, it's an accurate speaker. Uh, uh, the waveguide is also really good on this. Um, so it sounds good off and on axis, and it, it plays nice with any kind of room almost. Like a, like a 40, 40 hertz extension, as we said. High pass filters for easier. And I, I, this was I th I like the look of these. I think this one looks really nice. It's not they as they are aggressive. nice looking speakers in the Cali's for sure. They are and they feel physically better. Like just touching the cabinet, it's a better finish quality. They look better. There's no denying that. I mean, the the Cali's I like because they're such a good value. But you know, for is, fifty bucks more, speaker, yeah, it's a, it's a better speaker in terms you know, of the you know what's design. interesting about the uh, con about the the tilt of the sound is I, I see in a lot of studios where they put studio monitors and they're usually above ear level. And in this case, that would be a disadvantage. So would you turn the speaker upside down if that's the case? In order to <laughs> that, that might work, I suppose, turning upside down. You the know, other thing you could do is tilt it a lot. Yeah, you, yeah. Know, you could tilt it. Okay, here's something I actually did want to mention. That this is a really, really good speaker. Um, but the, the probably the one the one thing I would say that's, that's a, a, a little bit of a flaw is that every speaker has a lobe where you where you, the tweed ear or the mid range or the woofer the drivers are in phase right and it has like a it's, it's a horizontal and vertical lobe and you want to be in it to hear everything as it's supposed to to, all, to hear all the drivers go here you know um, with this it's it's a you can you can read about in the review is the lobe is like slightly tilted upward so if you're gonna listen to these. Um, there is there the crossover cancellation that happens with every speaker on the vertical axis. It happens in every every speaker where the drivers are separated by any distance. Ideally, what you want is to have that lobe centered on the tweeter. So if you you're, if you're listening on a tweeter or maybe a bit above the tweeter, a bit below the tweeter, it sounds everything sounds fine. And this that tweet, that lobe is tilted upward a little bit. So you want to be listening on axis or even a bit above axis, but below axis. The, there is a cancellation node between the uh, tweeter and the woofer that does start that it takes a bite out of the response. But yeah, you could you could just tilt it. You could tilt it so that you're listening on axis or maybe a bit above axis. You just don't want to listen to below axis. The 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 problem with that is that when you see the way studio monitors are mounted in a lot of studios, they're mounted up high. They're mounted high and they're yeah. not aimed right at the listener. So like that. That would be a problem for, for mixing. You have to know how these behave. If if you know how if you know the vertical behavior of these, you can use them just fine. But you have to understand, you know, or else you're, you'll be mixing with a, a gap in the response. If if they're yeah. if you're too if you're below the on axis response, and that's that's the sound that's hitting you. I think is like sort of a quick sort of rule that people can use. If you're setting them up for studio use, try to aim the tweeter at your chin or or a little below that, not your ear. And if you're using them in a home, make sure that they're sitting at or below your ear height. If they're, and if they're at your ear height, and that's tweeter level, you want to tilt it down a little bit. But don't mount them above your ear height. So if, you're, if you mount them above your ear height, you would have to tilt it a lot, like enough that it would be problematic probably for most speakers to be able to do that without it falling off the stand. So um, try to just try to aim that tweeter basically at your chin area here. And you should be able to be roughly in the right vertical axis to get the best sound, the best integration between the drivers. All speakers have this problem, but it's just it's a it's kind of a problematic position for this one, but it's one that you can deal with. Well, the cool thing about this too is that anybody that's considering like a sound bar under a TV, and if you have like a credenza under it that's you know six or seven feet wide, this is a kind of speaker you can put down on something like that instead of the sound bar. It's below your ear level when you're sitting, and you have perfect sound that that blows away anything you're gonna get out of a sound bar. Especially <laughs> well, it's it's a yeah, way way. I mean, they're obviously bigger, but yes, it's way better. These will smoke a sound so, bar. All yeah. right, so now we're gonna talk about the Atom Audio T7Vs. Um, now everything we're, we're, we have here will smoke a sound bar, but I will say this: of every one that I heard, this was my least favorite, and it was the one that measured the worst. But it's still pretty good. It, it sounds good. I like these. These sound good. I mean, they don't measure as well as the others. You can see that's a pr little bit more rugged of a response. Now, how much of the Atom Audios again? 
I think these are 500 a pair, so 250 each. Which is which is funny because years ago when I first was introduced to the brand at a trade show, they didn't sell a speaker, I think, for under a couple of thousand bucks. So they, obviously they changed their business yeah. model, and now they're doing more they, affordable speakers. And and the, the build quality on them is, I would say, in between the Presonus, which really was pretty good for the money, and the Kali's, which I think was the cheapest. But again, you're getting a lot for your money with those. Yeah, you're getting a lot. So the build quality on the Adam Audios was not great, but it but it, it wasn't awful either. Now here, the response is really rugged, but notice those directivity indices. So you've got the black dotted line and the red dotted line. Notice how flat those are. What that basically means is, yes, the response is rugged, but it's completely consistent. And because mm -hmm. it's completely consistent, you can EQ a lot of that out. So if you if you use like Odyssey Room EQ or Dirac, you could probably get a very good response with this. If Even uh, actually just plain PEQ could be used to fix this, and and it would be better. At the same time, I didn't really add much EQ and thought they sounded okay. Um, I did play with it a little bit. Um, as I said, they were my least favorite, but they weren't a bad speaker. Yeah, I, I like these. I think they sounded good. I think it goes to show that an imperfect response can still sound good, at least to me. Like uh, when I when I see like people, like you know, we publish reviews and people criticize the measurements in the reviews. But what I think happens a lot is people they don't they don't have the experience to cor correlate the measurements to how the speakers sound, mm -hmm. and also what we what we do is we try to like um and and when I you know write reviews and stuff and I look at measurements I think what what's the best way to use these speakers, so I think that a, a couple of slides on is that like the, the on axis response the the problem with this response is that I guess above let's see one kilohertz. That there's that the response is higher on average than it is below one kilohertz. That would that would cause um, that would. Well, they're bright. It, it would be a little bit a little bit bright. It would be a bit bright. Right. He says a little bit bright. I'm gonna tell you. I thought they were a lot bright, and I actually put on. They have a shelving filter. All of these have shelving filters uh, at different frequencies to kind of adjust to taste and setup. And I had to set them up with the bass kind of maxed out and the treble. <laughs> at the lowest level just for me to be happy with them now he teases me for being overly sensitive to bright speakers so we'll just say james's definition they're a little bright my definition they were really bright and i never found any set of settings that to me made it perfect but i was able to get them much better these are measured i think in the neutral setting right whatever whatever they call their kind of standard neutral setting i think so i think I hope so. <laughs> I, 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 I would have said in the review, <laughs> you know, I, in the review, I say, in all the reviews for the monitors, like, like Matt said, they all have settings in the back where you can actually adjust the response. You can, uh, you can, um, tame the trouble or you can boost the bass or, or vice versa, you know? And, um, I tell you in the review, what settings to use for, for all these that will give you the most neutral response since I tested them in all possible configurations, basically. So why don't we take thing... a look at the speakers now too? Okay, sure. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Now, the other thing I'll mention about the sound that I didn't love is of this very minor. Again, there's a lot of home audio speakers that I think are actually much, much worse than this. Here's Matt Lynch. But, yeah, I thought that they had a little bit of a nasally quality in the mid-range um, that I didn't love. So th that would be my take on the, now, the bad stuff. these have driver as well, right? No, this is a six and a half inch, isn't it? Oh, so it looks like Seven inch. inch. Seven inch. Oh, okay. It looks bigger than a six, yeah. Yeah, and... so, like, it, it has pretty powerful bass. And this... As opposed to the the other monitors we're going to talk about, this is explicitly a near field monitor. So this, um, it's intended to be used in the near field. Oh, okay. And uh, we should mention because people get into this stuff, the tweeter on. So the other two that we used had dome tweeters uh, mounted into waveguides. This one actually uses a uh, what are they called? AMT. AMT. AMT, AMT thank right? you. This is an yeah. AMT in a, a fairly shallow, small waveguide. And uh, I know a lot of people are into those. I mean, I still kind of take the view of it's 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 in the final product. You know, it's like the, the tweeter itself doesn't matter as much as how the sound of it is. So, like, I didn't hear this and say, oh, it's got magical treble compared to the other two. But there's definitely no denying that the, the treble was fine. Right? It had a nice smooth sound to it. Um, no, are these so. do these have it since you said they're strictly a near field monitor. Do they have a hissing problem like the Callies or was not, it not as much as the Callies, but so more it's, but it's more audible than the Personas but not as much as the Callies. So the Callies, again, are probably the worst of any studio monitor on the market that I've ever heard. I don't know about that. Okay, that I've ever heard. Um, now, when I say worst, I still don't want people to like think that they're awful and unusable. They're not. They're just they're worse than the JBLs, and they're Here's worse than say. these. Uh, they sound 
I used them for a while on my desktop, and I think they, I wasn't bothered by it. It's, it's a, a hiss. It's almost over exaggerates the sound. Uh, it, that would almost sound new. It's almost like a soft white noise. So, like, you've heard, like, white, it's like, that's the most benign mm -hmm. sound you could possibly have, you know, or like a, a pink noise, right? I think, I think James is trying to suggest that the hiss was lulling him to sleep, and so he didn't notice it, because... <laughs> no, it's, I it, it was, it's not, not, it's not intrusive, at least for me, I, I didn't have a problem well, with Well, I mean, I'll say this, as much as I'm picking on them for the hiss, if I had to take any of these home, or put my money behind them, it would be the Kylie's, so even though they have that hiss problem. But anyway, with these, they don't play as loud, for sure. Uh, I didn't think the bass was quite as good, although you thought it was pretty good. Maybe it was just the way I had it was set strong. up. It was strong. But the bass on this, if you don't turn it, I think if you don't turn it all the way down to the, the on the setting, to the lowest setting, the lowest setting actually gives you the most accurate bass. If you go higher than that to like its, its neutral setting, it, it's actually kind of, a, it has a rise. It's not a completely neutral bass. It's, it's a little bit higher than it is. There's more energy there, there than there is in, say, the mid-range. But now, it, it did, any, did any of these speakers bottom out with bass heavy music or, or did the manufacturer put good control no. mechanisms uh, in? I think they were all, well, I, I managed to bottom those out, but I was oh. fooling around with them. Okay. Um, the Kali's, it seemed like no matter what I did, I couldn't. I mean, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could apply some crazy amount of EQ to do it, but nothing that I did, no, no weird music turned way up with the bass control all the way up caused those two. I couldn't do it with the Personas. These ones I did, but I had the bass turned all the way up on these. And I was playing some pretty bass-heavy music, and then I haven't heard the other ones yet that we're going to get to next. I don't. I'm sure that you can't. I'd be shocked if you could overload those. Well, we still have one more slide, I think, on this one, right? Uh, well, here. So here's the response. So you can Two see the slides, consistency. Yeah. So you can see it's it's pretty consistent. So yeah, it's not as good as the others. It's rougher, but it's consistent. So again, EQ would fix this. Uh, Dirac would do wonders with this. Um, and then you you should explain this one. Sure. So, well, the on axis response, there's like like we said before, there's a rise that's on, on, the, on average the the response above one kilohertz. There seems to be a couple, you know, two maybe three dB higher than below um, one kilohertz. Um, that actually is ameliorated if you listen to them um, off axis. Like so, you can see that the the top um, curve is the on axis response. The bottom two curves are for for 25 and 30 degrees, which is probably the the angle that you'd be listening to them if you had them facing straight forward instead of towed in to, to face you. You know, so if if you have them angled straight forward, they're actually a pretty neutral speaker. That's that's a relatively um, it's a flat response. It, it maintains a tight window, and um, all the way to like almost 20 kilohertz. And so that's like I, I don't I don't know if I would want to use these to mix critical sound, you know, if I want to use these to actually make, you know, mix and record music or whatever on, on the on axis, but I think the off axis is good enough and, and it's neutral enough that it, it's telling you what's happening in, in those um, off axis responses. It, it's giving you a, a pretty accurate account of the sound. Yeah, I mean, again, I think tone the treble down with a shell filter and then add some good EQ, and you would have something that's more than neutral enough to mix with. And for home audio use, it would be fine. Yeah, it's fine. And also, I, I should say, well, we'll go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Yeah, so let's go to the pros. Um, like, like, it has a good directivity control. The, um, even though the on-axis response isn't isn't uh, as good as the others, it's still not terrible, really. Um, but it doesn't really exceed what you can get with, say, a passive speaker, you know. Um, I think these this these look the nicest of the the monitors that we have. It, it's just nice. It's a nice simple shape. You could use these in like a living room or something. It, it would. It, it looks as nice as passive speakers basically for the same cost. Um, I, I thought they imaged really really well. Um, the off like like I just the graph you just saw uh, has actually a pretty neutral off axis. If you listen to these on that on that like say 20 to 30 degree angle you're you are getting uh an accurate sound um for the cons uh yeah Shelling at the low frequency yeah the, yeah the, we already talked about that you need you have to be listening at 20 to 30 degrees to get that accurate response and also the the vertical axis is kind of narrow you want to be listening to these on axis or maybe 10 to 10 degrees above or below axis but you don't want to be listening to them too far, too far off the the vertical on axis response because um, the, the 
but as with m so many speakers, the conflict set in and you, you start to get uh, phase cancellation between the woofer and tweeter. And the 10 degrees vertical means basically, again, aiming them somewhere in your head. So somewhere between your, let's say, neck area and the top of your yeah. head. That the getting them somewhere, aiming. the right. tweeter, getting the tweeter aimed somewhere in that range should put them in the right vertical. If you've got these things pointed straight ahead and they're sitting low on a desk, it's going to be too low and you're not going to be in the right vertical. It's not going to have good integration. If you've got them up on really high studio monitor stands and they're not pointed at you in the right way, same problem. But, but that's the case with most speakers. The, these probably just a bit more so that you want to be on the, the dead on vertical axis, but... It's the case with most speakers. You should be listening on, on a vertical axis, on axis, you know, because yeah. unless unless you read our reviews and you see a speaker that where I, I do talk about the on axis response, where, where 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 the speakers sound best and how wide of a window you have, you know, for any of the reviews that that we publish. Um, mm -hmm. But every once in a while, we find a speaker that seems to defy the typical <laughs> yeah. rules of thumb for things like. The vertical response and yeah. this is one of them for sure so i think we should move on to the rbh and i haven't heard these yet so i'm kind of relying on you for this one i, I i'll listen to okay. them though before tonight last but not least is the rbh sound pm8s and now these are an active design and i think they have the same kind of dsp technology that are in my svtrs system they, they do and they're really a pretty unusual speaker in that regard now they're they're not 500 dollars a pair these are these are so, far far these are more way more expensive than all the other speakers we've talked about put together and none of these other speakers well what's the price are they about four grand a pair i don't remember exactly they're they're, they're four grand a pair if you get the, the composite stone side panels without those are like a 400 hundred dollar upcharge per speaker so that's a pretty expensive like add-on right but without that right, then that for, would be 3200 yeah. for a pair with okay. if you don't want the the, the stone sidewalls now, compared to the much cheaper speakers, I'll just tell you the build quality is night and day. Now, you, like you see this picture, you probably see that port on the front, and it looks like kind of a run-of-the-mill port, but I'm just going to tell you because physically we have them here. Not only are they bigger than all the other speakers, they're heavier, the cabinet is of a better quality, the drivers are clearly of better quality, the amplifier is clearly of better quality, <laughs> and then the DSP that's in the amplifier is more sophisticated, allowing FIR filters. And right. we were curious. I mean, to be honest, we'd heard a lot of negative things about speakers that have these types of linear phase crossover designs is actually having problems that arise from that. But we saw an unusual benefit. Sure. Um, now, before we get into that, too, the, I think the ports are flared, too, right? So that's, that I helps don't think so. No, I think it's actually a straight port. A straight I, port. Mean, oh, I thought it was a flared port on the inside. No, it'd be nice if uh, RBH did something like that. It, it, to be honest, the port looks a little cheap compared to the rest of the speaker but you didn't yeah. notice any issues with it right no it's a large port i mean the, the, like i said in the review that's the port you'd find on a subwoofer because this has subwoofer type bass output so like right. the port is fine it it, it, it it provides very powerful bass it's, it's like a three inch diameter or something like that three by like what eight or nine inches I is mean, it really a, that big yeah it's, it's huge port. It's, it's it's a port you'd find on a subwoofer that is a big port so looking at the measurements i'll just say I was a little disappointed at first. I was expecting better. It's got all this fancy DSP, and uh, compared to some of the others, like the Kali's, it's not quite as flat. Now, on the other hand, there's no port resonance. Anything that is there is very narrow. So if you consider that all the stuff that's there that's like not perfectly flat is, is inaudible. It's high-Q yeah, high stuff. Peaks and dips. It's it, not audible. Yeah, it really is pretty good. Um, you do see that the tweeter on, in the horizontal axis uh, it, the dispersion is pretty narrow, meaning that at, once you get past about three kilohertz, you start to see the response fall off more than the others did, the which is why axis. you see uh, off axis, which is why you see that upward tilt in the two directivity indices. So on the so dotted is this red, more of a narrow dispersion speaker than Matt. It's than it's other. actually uh, it's I wider. would not call it that. It's wider up to five kilohertz and then narrower past that sort of. Okay. So that's why it looks like this. So basically the speaker has very wide, much wider than the other ones, dispersion up to five kilohertz. And then it may not be narrower than the others, but it narrows more like it's not consistent. And that actually happens frequently with speakers that don't use waveguides. So in order to get a speaker that has a more consistent change in directivity, you, you typically need to use a waveguide. And this one is built more like a typical home audio speaker would be, which is why you see that behavior. Now, because it's happening so high, it's very unlikely to be particularly audible. Yeah, I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you want the full, like, um, 
the, the you can see it does start to beam or, or the dispersion narrows on on high trouble so if you want if you want to hear that high trouble you have these are the speakers that you do want aimed at you on the horizontal axis these are so make sure these these guys are facing you and uh, they, they're they're overall they're accurate this is an accurate sound you could mix with these the all that jagged stuff is like it's inconsequential those little little spikes and little little very narrow peaks that's it's inconsequential you, you can't hear that um, so like it, it, it's pretty it's good it sounds good and, and it's, it's an accurate loudspeaker overall so let's so go ahead James, James since you've actually heard all four of these speakers and this is a significantly more expensive product almost 10 times the cost of the Cali is it I know you're not going to get 10 times the performance obviously because of the law of diminishing returns and these are already good products to begin with but is there a significant step up in sound quality and dynamics and bass or anything like that that would really justify having a product like this? Um, oh, these are my favorite. Well, that's um, a good that's a good sign. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna say. And there's no hiss, right? No, there is. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I asked him the same thing. I said, "Well, they're way more expensive." Does the using the higher end amplifier, which I think those have Pascal modules in them, like does it have no hiss? He goes, "No, it has hiss." So they yeah, so do. it looks like if you spend even a fortune, you still have hiss. Um, I'm gonna say, how do they compare to the less expensive ones? Like, there is a, I would say there is a law of diminishing returns. These are expensive, and like, do they sound like like let's say so these have the stone side panels and like let's say the Cali's so those are 200 each these are 2,000 each with the side panels that's a 10 times difference they sound 10 times better no but right. they sound really good they they have more dynamic range they have they're using really robust drivers and um the build quality is just not you know th th these PM8s probably weigh as much as all the other speakers put together. Wow. Yeah, you, you can stack these people. These, like, those, I'm not going to hold them to show you. <laughs> so I can hold actually, them. I, I have see, them here. I want to see that it. actually. To show in you, fact, but... why don't we show? Why don't we? This is a good segue, right? Why don't we show them now? If you, even sure. if you both you, okay, you lift bear it. with me because Matt, is... Matt, since you're, we're going to make this announcement here. Matt, I actually convinced as a joke a year ago. I said you should move to Florida. Then he went and talked to his wife, and she thought it was a good idea. So now Matt is going to be moving to Florida. He's going to be pretty close to me. We're going to get him at the gym. We gotta bulk them up that way. That way, you can lift these speakers without having James kind of uh, doing a two team here. We're gonna get Matt bulked up. See, the problem was James isn't. He's stronger than me, but he's not stronger than me enough to make up for how weak I am. So I decided <laughs> I gotta move to Florida because Gene is strong enough to make up for like five normal men. Uh, yeah. So I just just for the record, my wife and I had been talking about moving to Florida for years and just decided now that it was a good opportunity i will be near gene but i will not be in the same town as him and he, we're doesn't, building... he doesn't want to be that close to me no it's just <laughs> i can't so uh but we're... he does want to be that far from me <laughs> but i yes but i needed to get away from james we're, we're getting a divorce um but i'm building a custom house so just like uh gene has been uh highlighting some of the build stuff there's going to be a custom soundproof home theater and i'll i'll highlight what we're doing in that and i think it, some yeah. of it's going to be a little unusual, so I don't know how it's going to mass appeal there, but I think you guys will at least enjoy it, and I'll show you all. But anyway, let's go back to this one. So um, Can we get that in full frame, or is it too heavy to pick it, up? It's pretty heavy. Just, what if we careful. put it here? Can put you it see on the that? Armrest. Yeah. Oh, wow, that thing's massive, yeah. Yeah, so... No, that's an aluminum. That's a black anodized aluminum cone, right? Yes. It is, and I believe that's what you have three of, and it's clearly, like, this has a yeah. cast frame... These other ones all are not as good. I don't know what they are, but they're probably steel stamped frames. But yeah, you can physically tell. Plate. It's got a, you know. Yeah. yeah, so this is like a really good driver. The cabinet itself is covered in a high quality vinyl material that kind of looks like leather. And it's definitely a better material than what you see on the other ones. It's got these stone sides. When you knock on it, this thing is solid. The others are not. They have a hollow. Yeah, the stone sound. actually serves to, to put more mass into the cabinet. So I'm sure it helps control resonances in the cabinet too, right? I mean, it's. Probably, I, I, I mean, I would think so. I don't know how they've used on this. Definitely would add um, a lot of strength to the sidewalls. But then the the back of it, I don't know if we can let, flip let it around without. That. Yeah. So this, oh, I believe this is about a, fifty pounds. It's, it's like something like that. Something. So this yeah. has the oh, Marani um, DSP with Pascal amplifier modules, I believe, and uh, and you have some version of that. So these yep. are yep. pretty good amp. I mean, for anybody who's familiar with the different DSP modules or the different, uh, I mean, amplifier modules, 
the Pascals are pretty good. They're pretty good quality. They measure pretty well. Yes, there's a little bit of hiss on this apparently. I haven't heard it yet, but I'll just say like these other ones probably are using some inexpensive like TI chips or something like that that put out maybe 20, 30 watts, something like that. This is probably putting out, I would think... 250 for the Wolfer and 150 for the Tweeter. There you go. So that's, way, that's way more lot. power. That's a huge amount of difference in dynamic range. Uh, somebody's, a couple of people have asked us, can you bypass the DAC on any of these products? I, I would say probably you can't, no. right? They no. don't have, I mean, I think what they're really getting is do they have digital input? So not a single one of these has a digital input. So no, you can't do that. But I don't know that the DAC is the problem. I mean, the amplifier modules that are used in all of them, except for the PM8s, are not going to be good enough to support a better DAC anyway. So, you, you know, you could do that if you wanted to, you know, you could get into the circuit board there and try to bypass what they've done. Uh, keep in mind, though, when you say DAC, like what you're actually doing is you're going to, uh, there's an ADC in all of them that's probably not very good, an analog to digital converter. Some of the hiss probably comes from that because most of the cheap ones are pretty lousy. And mm -hmm. then there's all the DSP that needs to be done. And then there's the DAC. So even if you went in, bypassed that DAC, put in a higher quality one, what are you going to do about the ADC? What are you going to do about the cheap amplifier modules? You know, Matt, that's a good point. And this is something I saw recently when I reviewed the Yamaha 5200 processor, which has a state-of-the-art DAC, right? It has the ESS DAC. The thing measures great. But when you use the analog input and convert it digital, that's when I saw about a 10 or 15 dB noise floor rise. And when I questioned Yamaha about it, they're like, well, we're not using a state-of-the-art ADC. And that's exactly probably what's causing the noise in most of these products is the ADC. It's not the DAC. I think so. I mean, we, it'd be, we, we'd have to talk to the actual engineers that designed these who might know better, who have actually sat and played around with different chips to see. Uh, I believe um, that uh, Kali has said they're, they're actually looking for ways to reduce the hiss on their design and future implementation. So we'll see. They keep saying they're doing that, and it doesn't seem like it's gotten that much better yet. But all of them have problems with it. And it's been one of the things that's always, I like a quiet speaker, so it's always bothered me that even though you can get these really good linear responses with DSP, you also add noise, inevitably. Like, there just doesn't seem to be a system out there that's totally noise-free without getting into very, very expensive, I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars to get into completely noise-free DSP. Someone's um, asking what an ADC, just real quick, it's an analog to digital converter. So if you're running an analog source into these products because they have DSP, it's going to take that analog source and convert it digital to do its processing and then back to analog again. Exactly, right. So let's go back to the measurements really quick. So on these ones, you can see that there is a pretty flat response. I mean, again, if you if you kind of recognize that most of those little peaks and dips are uh, relatively benign, you can see it's a pretty flat linear response. Obviously, the tweeter beams above 5 kilohertz more aggressively than we see like with the others. But there is an issue that I want to bring up. Now, you, you like the sound of this one best, so it's obviously not that audible, but there is a directivity mismatch in the speaker. So that 8-inch woofer is starting to narrow its dispersion before the tweeter comes in. Um, and so the, the basically the bottom of the tweeter's response has a wider dispersion than the top of the woofer's response, which is mm -hmm. high. You can see that dip around uh, 1 kilohertz. That's what's causing that, that kind of shift. But you said it wasn't overly audible? Yeah, it's like, I mean, if you, you can see it on the graph, it's a matter of like a few dB off axis, way off axis, right? So like, it's not, it's not a really issue. I mean, it, it'd be better if it weren't there, academically speaking, right? But what's the audible consequence of it? Well, I thought, I thought these sounded really good, but I guess, I guess these are ones you want, like I said before, you want to be listening to on axis. The off axis does get a little rugged because of the directivity mismatch. Um, but that's just listen to them on axis, you know, like a normal speaker. So yeah. Now, fine. just for, for those who are kind of curious from an academic speaker design standpoint, again, because I like to pretend that I'm smarter than these speaker designers, uh, but they, of course, have issues they have to deal with in terms of practicality. Uh, an 8-inch woofer can't be mated to a typical direct radiating tweeter uh, without having this mismatch. So what you're seeing is, is true of any 8-inch two-way speaker that isn't using a waveguide. The nice advantage of a waveguide is that you can essentially narrow the dispersion of the tweeter at, at the crossover point so that you get a better match. And that's why on the other 8-inch speakers we saw that had the big waveguides, we didn't see this problem. If they were using direct radiator tweeters, like you often see with 8-inch two-way consumer speakers, you would see the exact same problem you see here. Actually, probably much worse. And we do see that with, with a lot of speakers from a lot of mainstream, very expensive high-end brands that are using even six and a half inch woofers actually don't mate well with like a one inch direct radiator tweeter. 
So is that how like the JBL M2 has a giant waveguide because it's trying to match the 15 inch woofer and it's crossed over like six or 700 hertz? And you need a much larger waveguide. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain point. So, like a 15 inch woofer will match the directivity of a particular size of waveguide. It's about 15, 16 inches. That's the point at which the two will match at around 7, 800 hertz. Uh, 12 inch woofer, again, 12 inch woofer with like a 13 inch or so waveguide tends to match in directivity. So, what that means is that an 8 inch woofer needs about an 8 or 9 inch waveguide to match. This one doesn't have that. So, the advantage of the waveguide is you can get good directivity matching and you get a better prettier looking graph the disadvantage is it narrows the dispersion so there is a sound difference between wide and narrow dispersion speakers and that distinct sound difference is not necessarily appealing to everybody got you okay um let's go back to the slide yeah you want to say something else before i switch back to the slides or um yeah i guess one thing is this does have outputs um, so if you wanted to uh, the string this uh, as I have, if you wanted to string this to a sub right, you, there is a there is a um, XLR output and um, there's also a, a, like high pass filters you can apply on this that I think that 80 hertz is is one of them that you you can it's almost self base managed. You set set the low pass on the sub to 80 hertz, set the high pass on this to 80 hertz, and you don't really need I mean. To, It'd be better if you had some kind of process for dealing with all that, but you can you can actually set these up and make them with the sub really well. Another thing is we were talking before about the, like digital inputs. You mentioned somebody wanting a digital input. Um, their RBH is looking at a um, what are those AES? What what is that called? The oh, AES, AES, AES EBU or yeah the... yeah EBU the AES EBU digital input. So uh -huh. they they want to put that on future models. This one doesn't have it, but they want they want to get that on there. So you know, maybe. And I think your your speakers has that, right, Gene? You have the yeah. ASEBU digital inputs. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there's other digital inputs that have gotten more popular in pro audio that... Dante is another one that's... Da that's yeah. I Dante mean, that's like, is cool because it's Ethernet. You know, you could just put... You could put right. The, uh, it's a digital buttons. input, but yeah. it's actually a, an Ethernet-based control protocol. So it's it's a little bit... For pro audio use, it's a little bit better. For home audio use, it's, it's useless because there's nothing that has that. Um, I mean, that's another problem with this. Like, if you wanted to use these in a surround system, they'd probably be a great speaker for a surround system. But one of the problems is if you did want to do the digital input because of copyright protection, uh, with the exception of the processor you have, basically none of them have digital output on a per-channel basis um, yeah. because they don't, they don't allow you to do that. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, back to the uh, pros and cons. So, you know, we've gone over all of this, but we never talked about that feature that I oh, said yeah. that the DSP in this actually. So this has FIR filters, which allows for uh, essentially linear phase, um, which makes the speaker itself a fully linear phase speaker. Now, because of that, there there's an argument, and it's also got very steep crossovers, unusually steep. So a lot of people have argued, well, doesn't that cause response problems? Well, as you can see, the response was mostly fine. Everything we saw was more likely an issue of the drivers themselves than it was the crossover. But you found unusually good vertical uh, coverage, like much better than the others and actually much better than typical two-way speakers. Yeah, this, this is definitely deserves some, some discussion. Um, so like we, like we said with the other speakers, you want to be listening roughly on axis. You know, it's always the best axis to listen to, or where your ears are level with the tweeter or the tweeter is pointed at your ears. Um, and and on, if, as you go up, above and below axis, uh, you start to get nulls, where, where the tweeter and woofer, because of the difference in distance, respective of them to your ear, they, they start to fight, you know, they start to cancel each other out and, and you get big, big dips in the response. That kind of happens with these very slightly, but it's, it's vertical response is, uh, I have probably the best I've ever seen from a speaker that, that wasn't coaxial. Okay. So there was, there was hardly any like, like bickering between the tweeter and woofer basically. Um, so you could listen to these as I do, and, and actually I, I've been listening to them. I've been using them, you know, I mean, the, the review is, is waiting to be published, and I kind of don't want to send these back because I have them set up as my desktop speakers because, like, when, when I, like, listening to music or just using my computer, right, I'm always shifting my posture. I'm always, like, like slouching way low in my seat or something like that, or maybe I'm, I'm sitting upright, right? So there's a lot of change in, like, vertical position, right? These don't change sound. There's It sounds... 
the same over the vertical axis, which is very unusual for um, a, a non-coaxial speaker. Look, they have like the best vertical like, consistency and vertical response that I've ever seen, like, like I said, which wasn't a coaxial. So, like, so these are the speakers that you want to use in a studio if you can't get the tweeter pointed right at your ears because they have such a, a wide and and I guess I didn't include that at the the uh, graph of their vertical response in this slideshow but I had to save something to review because this this review isn't isn't published yet right I didn't want to spoil it completely yeah yeah and so like you'll you'll see in the review that the the vertical response is is abnormally excellent it's just really good and like you you can if you want a speaker where you don't have to worry about the vertical, like don't have to have the, the tweeter aimed exactly at you on, on a vertical axis, right? These are just as good as it gets without getting into coaxials, you know? And like, as we were saying before, coaxials, they're not perfect and they have compromises of their own. So this is a, it's yep, just a really do. good speaker. For, um, do, do Should we go over the pros and... Well, I think we covered all this. I mean, we kept saying over and over again, the build quality is clearly night and day better than the other ones. I mean, it really is. Uh, they have more dynamic range. We talked about how the amp is significantly more, more, powerful. more powerful. Yeah, more and powerful. it's a better quality amplifier as well. The unusual vertical uh, coverage, the on-axis response is really pretty decent. Now, you, you, this is a total James word. He, he said they look it's very swank. swank. <laughs> um, Actually, I want to go into this just a little bit. Because there's, this isn't just a studio monitor. Uh, RBH isn't known for making studio monitors. I think this might be their first one, right? I think yep. they made pro, they've made pro equipment before, but like for theaters, for commercial installations yep. yeah, and stuff exactly. like that. Yeah. But they've they've never really done it. Uh, and so I don't think they really wanted to make just a studio monitor. This is too nice to be. There's too much like. Uh, this looks too too nice. To be just a student, I think they wanted to make like a a, a a speaker that's like a jack of all knife, knife. I mean, one of the, the a jack of all knife. Jack, what jack is this? of all trades. Yeah. Jack of all trades kind of speaker. What? Why does it? Oh, no, I don't know. The, the phrase jack knife. Anyways, um, yeah. So they wanted to make a speaker that you could use in home audio just as easily as pro audio, or, or, or just as easily as a studio monitor. But the thing is, here's the thing: a studio monitor has the same. Or ideally, a, a home audio speaker would share the same sonic attributes as a studio monitor, right? They would both have ad or accurate sound. They're both sound reproducers. It's not as critical for a studio for a home audio speaker to have, you know, as accurate of a sound as a, a studio monitor. But you, you kind of want, you know, most people kind of expect the the input to sound the output to sound like the input, right? Without too much linear distortion. Um, so like. RBH, they're not obviously they're not very experienced at making um, a studio monitor. I don't think they're really interested in making something like that. They were making a home audio, a, a speaker they could use for home audio or studio work or or any number of roles, right? Near field, far field. These are made for like mid field and near field use. Um, and so, like, why would you put like stone sidewalls on a studio monitor? They look, it's too like almost classy. You, you, and it's expensive. That's a four hundred dollar upcharge, right? For those, yeah. those stone, so, so this is like a a hi-fi speaker and a studio monitor. They wanted and, to make and, something. And I do think, uh, just speaking with RBH, last time that we hear, it looks like they're they're working on a series of active monitors. So this won't be the last. They're going to make smaller. They're going to make bigger. And I think that we've been saying this for a while now. This is the future of speakers. I mean, doing active. DSP controlled speakers really should be the way we we should be progressing going yeah. forward. Yeah, I think you you took some heat when you had mentioned recently that FIR was the future because people are saying well it's been around a while it has but it wasn't practical before. So the thing that's really changed between the 80s and 90s when the technology first became viable but expensive and today is that back then only very basic forms of it were possible. It was very expensive. And there were a lot of compromises. The DSP, uh, the AD and DA converters were not great quality. That was very noisy. The number of taps available for the filter was very low, so the resolution of the filter wasn't very good. And the amplifiers that were being included often were just big Class AB amps, basically. And so because they were big and not efficient, they often weren't powerful enough. Now, you're t I mean, this has a 250-watt and 150-watt amp built into each one. So it's way more powerful than a typical, for instance, receiver, even most people's aftermarket amps would be. 
The Pascal modules are very good. They're not the best, mm -hmm. but they're very, very good. They're definitely up there. Um, I won't be shocked if we start to see things like this that are using, and we already know there are some that are based on the Hypex Encore. They're not too bad. They're actually about the same quality as this, but the Purify, for instance, that has come out recently are even better yet. Um, the DSP is so much better than it used to be, it's not even funny. I mean, it's night and day difference to the point that we're now looking at thousands of taps, even in some cases tens of thousands of taps, instead of uh, a dozen taps. As it I mean, yeah, was. back in the day, I saw those comments too, and they're like, we've been doing this since the 80s. Yeah, when we had Commodore 64 level processing. That was <laughs> right. the kind of power, so, one megahertz processors. So the, <laughs> the systems back then were so bad that you, yes, they existed, but they just, they were clunky and they weren't as capable. And now we're at a point where you can stick a, a significant amount of DSP processing and amplifier power into something that's basically like this big. Uh, I mean, the, the amp module on the back of that is only about if you can see with my hands, it's about like this, and it's only about that thick. Inside of that is the 400 watts worth of power and tons of DSP processing, and it's just going to get better. I mean, that's the nice thing. is it's. It, I think it's gotten to a point where its day has come, and it's just going to keep getting better. The fact cool. that there's $200 a pair bookshelf studio monitors that has more DSP capabilities than we saw in, for instance, the 90s in, in $10,000 studio monitors is itself pretty impressive too, which is what makes these cheap speakers so good. And so I, I applaud RBH for doing this. I think it's giving us an opportunity now. You know, in the old days, people used to say, well, don't waste your time and money on linear phase. It's not audible, or if it is audible, it's so small of a difference, what's the point? Now, I think the point is it doesn't cost you anything. It used to cost something to do it. Now, you can just throw it in. And we're seeing some advantages of it. I mean, this this speaker behaves like a coaxial, even though it's not, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. and I've in my, in my own experience using the SVTRS system, and I actually have a, a YouTube video review coming out with Don Dunn. Um, he got to listen to him as well. He spent a lot of time listening to these speakers. Switching on and off the FIR filters to me was a game changer. I mean, it just made everything so much more cohesive and pinpointing. It almost sounded like the very best I've heard in an ESL speaker, but with much more dynamic range because we had cone drivers. And it was just, I couldn't believe it. Like, I didn't expect to hear that kind of a difference. Yeah, I'm excited to see where this all goes. Uh, you know, I only expect more and better things. I won't be shocked that if in the next five years we start to see something like a Kali Audio you know, I don't know, maybe it's $600 a pair with FIR filters built in as well, behaving be awesome. that much better. Yeah. So somebody, I just want to bring this up and then we're going to wrap this up. Uh, somebody says we focus mostly on frequency response analysis. And, I, and, and I'll say this briefly and then Matt, you can expand. Frequency response really is the primary metric in loudspeakers. If you get good on axis and off axis, it tells you almost everything you need to know about that speaker. Wouldn't you agree? That's really, yeah. I mean, it's really night and day to have good linear response in the frequency domain. I, there, and there's a couple of reasons for it. So, so the research has shown that the frequency response information that, we, that we're specifically showing, which is also dispersion, tells you pretty much everything you need to know about how a speaker image is, what it's going to, like what the timbre is like, uh, how neutral it is. All of that is caught up, if you will, in those frequency response measurements that we show. Now, there are other things like nonlinear performance, but that doesn't contribute to our perception of sound quality nearly as much as the frequency response stuff that we show. And there's a different, probably more important issue, which is that the difference in nonlinearity between this inexpensive $200 speaker here and that $2,000 speaker there is so small that neither one really has audible distortion until a point that's pretty much inconsequential. So yes, the more expensive one plays louder, but within the normal range that most people are listening, they both have low enough distortion that it's not particularly audible. Okay. Uh, why don't you put that slide back real quick on all four of the speakers? Because I just want to give maybe a, a quick recap. So we've finished the RBH kind of analysis. Now we're just going to give a recap of the four speakers. <laughs> maybe we should just hold them all up at once. Now. Hold them all up I, at once. I would like them. to see that. I, people are asking, actually. <laughs> we, I, we could do that. It would be cumbersome. We could do that. James right. could probably hold the RBH and Matt could hold the other three. <laughs> that's that's about right that's about weight fair. wise. That's yeah, that fair. is that is probably fair. Somebody's asking about the differences in imaging. So James, you've heard all of them. I've only heard the three less expensive ones. My personal opinion was that they all imaged well. I thought the Atom Audio had a little bit of a wider dispersion style of imaging, if if I could say that about it, you know. But the other two I think sounded the same. 
uh, from an imaging standpoint? Imaging, um, uh, geez, uh, the problem with that is like, no problems. Just come on. I, I know. Well, the thing is, like, I didn't. You, you'd really have to AB them to to know what the imaging differences are. And my, my when I when I did to compare these speakers, it was so long. I just don't remember. Yeah. All right. So I'm a big yeah. imaging person. I can't speak to the PM8s. Uh, I'll have to hear them later to to be able to give that. But for the other three, this is what I'll say: the Personas and the Kali's have the narrowest dispersion. It's the most controlled dispersion, and it has the distinct, what I would call stereotypical, controlled dispersion style of imaging, which is, I, I would call it laser-like. It's very precise. I like that. I think that that's the way studio recorded music should be heard. There's a counter argument that I've mentioned before, which is that wider dispersion is actually better. Um, it gives a more diffuse sound stage, but people would argue that compared to how you hear music in real life, it's more accurate because, uh, for instance, an orchestra is very diffused. So the, the laser, like, if you will, is sort of artificial. It's like, I think that the argument they'd be making is it's like turning up the detail control. So right. I thought of these, the Personas and the Kali sounded the same. I really don't remember hearing a difference in the imaging. I thought the Atom Audios had um, a little bit more diffused soundstage to them. Uh, but, you know, it, it was kind of a deeper, more holographic image because of that. Uh, and I can totally see why people would like it. You commented specifically on that. With the PM8 being having that FIR filter and being more coherent, I won't be shocked if they actually had a pretty special imaging, but I haven't heard it, so I don't know. And you say you don't remember? You call an amnesia on this one? Well, it's the problem. Or he's is just like... he's been listening to that speaker specifically for the last <laughs> couple of weeks or so. The thing is, like, right. you can't. Our memory deteriorates really fast, right? And like, I can't remember. I can remember some things about some of the speakers, but but. That specific, you would need to like have A, B compared them recently. That's, that's what I think. I think you can't really, to talk about uh, imaging, unless you notice something specific, right? And you remembered it. Well, I wasn't I wasn't listening to anything specific about the imaging of each speaker. I know that they all imaged well, but I, I can't even compare them because I wasn't like, I, I don't have like a reference point because I wasn't listening to any specific thing in any any one track that like I could compare the imaging with, so like I, I just they all imaged really well. You know, like, sorry, that's, that's 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 the best I can do. So the bottom line in this roundup basically is the the star of the show, the value speaker, is really that Cali Audio. For everything it does at two hundred dollars each, that's a hard speaker to beat. Even though it's not perfect, and the cosmetics aren't that great, and it's a little noisy if you're in the near field, it's an incredible value. It's got the best measured performance of any speaker we've ever measured in that price point it's actually among the best measured performance we've measured in any speaker period for any price point um so yeah and it was the one that i liked the best although i i will i would be lying if i didn't say part of it came from the sort of academic side of knowing it measured better than the others mm. um you liked the pm8 the best it was the most expensive i haven't heard it yet yeah the pm8 just for the uh vertical dispersion like i said i don't I don't have my head in a vice when I listen to music. Like I, I do a lot of work on the computer and I do a lot of other stuff, right? Like playing computer games or whatnot, you know, just listening to music while I'm browsing the internet or something like that. And like, I don't, I don't have to like, the, the sound doesn't change regardless of how bad my posture is. And my posture is usually not very good, right? And like, that's, that's where you, and also they have endless dynamic range for, for a near field monitor, right? You can crank these. You don't really need a subwoofer unless you want really deep bass. They they dig below 40 hertz very competently. So like mm -hmm. um, and also they're very easy to hook up with a sub without needing to resort to like bass management from a outboard processor. And that's that's what I do because my my uh, desktop system does have a couple subs and I just like wired them up to those subs and it, and it sounded fine. It measured good. It, the problem is like. Well, I have the space on my desktop for speakers that large, right? Most people don't. But um, if you're looking for like a high fidelity speaker just, just for your home and you don't want to screw around with like, oh, what's the best um, what's the best amp for my speaker, you know, or what's what kind of processor should I get? You still need a processor, but you don't need to really EQ these. All you need to do is aim them at you because they have a flat response already. 
if yeah. you don't want to screw around with a, a complex audio setup with all kinds of uh, you know components, just get these and a simple processor and you're set. You know the simplicity of it is like it's a bookshelf speaker, but it sounds like a full range speaker and it has the dynamic range of say a tower speaker. You know, and so you can just um get a pair of these, get some like like a an audio interface for a PC or whatever platform you're listening to and you're set. It, it, they sound great and you don't need anything else. Um, I, I hope more people get a chance to listen to these. I hope RBH like sounds more of these out because they're really good. And all the other speakers are to like, if we're going to like um, summarize these speakers, like we said, Matt really likes the Kelly's and I do too. I'm going to have to go, if I had to, between the Kali's and the Presonus, which are kind of head-to-head -head competitors, I don't even want to like. I don't even want to decide between them because they both have these attributes. They're not, but they're both have. They have their flaw. The flaws aren't serious. They both have some really good attributes about them. I, I don't even want to choose between them. The Atom Audios are really good if you need something for like. For studio monitor use, I don't know if they're the best studio monitor. <laughs> they're not, but they're. I don't. I think as a studio monitor, they don't. They're not quite as good as the the Kali or Persona speaker. But if you wanted something like like I said, like a, a simple self amplified speaker for your living room or your bedroom, they are really really good. I mean, they're, they're not huge, and Let's just say, like, for for an equally priced sound bar, they, they, they would smoke any sound bar, you know? For sure. In fact, I have um, probably most of the $500 sound bars on the market. <clears throat> They're not so, even in the ballpark of this. Uh, this question just came up, and I, I haven't seen it, but apparently ASR reviewed it with a Kipple system, and they didn't measure well the Cali's. The cow. No, that's not. That's not correct. No, they're talking about. They're, they're, not, they're mixing something up. So yeah. they're talking about the coaxial version, and that one had a broken woofer in it. And if you keep reading through that one, you'll see that the uh, uh, measurements that they got after they got a, a model that had a functioning woofer was really, fine. Really, really that was the higher end model, and as I said, mm -hmm. it was a busted one. This one, the LP8, is their bottom line one, and I don't know if they've actually measured that one yet. Um, but they but, haven't. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I we got. So. I want to check out that coaxial three-way from Cali. Now that we know that Cali makes solid speakers, I think we probably should explore what the best they can do. And you know, I'm, I'd be more interested in jumps. seeing what they they do. They go above and beyond the, the even the. I mean, I'm sure the the coaxial is really good. It does measure very well on on audio science review. It, the shame of that review is that's the front page. Like that, yeah, they, not, when they I, didn't correct the measurements. Yeah, when I, when, I, when I actually, oh. I, I was telling people, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have a a, a Kali Audio speaker to review. They were saying, oh no, they don't measure well at all. That's that doesn't it's gonna be bad, right? Because they've only seen the first page of that review. Uh, Audio Science Review should uh, they should put the correct measurements on the first page. Hmm. And, and That's not the, the first time this has happened with them, so I, I can yeah. understand. No, and, and I'll say in their defense, I mean, I don't think that they got like a one that had been put through the ringer and it broke. I think they had a brand new one. It just happened to be broken. So there may be some quality. I mean, these are not well made. The 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 build quality is I think you're overstating low. how they're not like shoddy. No, they're they're pretty they're I don't fine. know. They're, they're on the shoddy they're 200, side. They're $200 they're $200 per speaker, you know, per I'm just saying I wasn't surprised when it turned out there was a broken woofer, and it did make me wonder if there was some, some possible QC or build you're quality issues. The, the, I mean, they're still my favorite of them. It's just uh, I think the build is not. Yeah, it's not. Get it's what not, you pay for. It's not the greatest. The, 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 it's not really heavy duty. It's not a heavy duty. It's good enough. So what, what Callie is doing is they're, they're, they're taking everything. Um, they're taking away everything that doesn't make a difference for, for, for the sound right. So they're not spending any. They don't spend a penny on anything extraneous. So the the cabinet is as just as good as it has to be, and not more. So and that's so how they're you get. Engineering, they're engineering. They're engineering a speaker to live to its warranty period, not necessarily beyond it. <laughs> well, maybe we haven't had these long enough to know how durable they're going to be in the long run. That could be an issue, and others who have owned them a while might know if that is a problem with them. They've they've last. How long have you had them though? Like six months now. 
a while. I don't I don't remember exactly how long. I'm not but, dead yet. But I haven't heard of any like, I haven't heard of serious like, uh, chronic quality control issues from these speakers. I don't think it's a problem. I haven't heard of it. If you if if there was, I think I would well, have heard of it. And, you're yeah. probably right. The other side of it though is that we know that people could get a broken speaker like that one and not even notice. I mean, it's sad that that's yeah, true, but, but that is true, and yeah, so it's but, possible people have broken ones yeah, and don't you, realize that's, it. You know, that goes back to like. I mean, you're basing. That's like a small sample size, you know. For let, let's let's hear what like you know what, what a hundred people have to say who were on those one, not just one guy who was sent one that went through multiple shipping, you know, um, routes, you know, and it did end up with a, a malfunctioning Wilford. We don't know. I, I, I don't think your, your, your sample size to judge the quality control I, speakers is I just too small. It's just one speaker that it had was, a problem. It was also the only studio monitor with a bad Wilford, though. Yeah, but how many... Uh, we could go into this, Gene, but like then we're just wasting... <laughs> You know, we'll we'll talk about this later, Mister. <laughs> we'll get in that debate later. We always this is why debates. I'm moving to Florida. Yeah, well, this is, you I'm, know, I'm driving him away. Th this is a topic I'm going to actually be covering or covering with Don Dunn um, from HD2020 because he's a very experienced integrator. He's been in the industry for 30 plus years. We're going to do a, a video that talks about reliability and durability of brands because you know there are people that are always looking for the cheapest thing on the market not necessarily understanding that some of the brands have a legacy of reliability and durability. And that's something that you have to factor in when you're buying something, not just looking for the lowest price, but also looking for something that has staying power as well. And that's a whole nother topic. Um, and especially true with subwoofers, because I've noticed subwoofer amplifiers have a higher degree of failure than virtually any other product in the consumer market. Yeah, a lot of companies have actually switched to very, very expensive subwoofer amplifiers because it's from a warranty standpoint, it's cheaper to put an amplifier that costs four times as much than it is to replace it four times. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Th th that's also something to consider. I mean, uh, Kali isn't, they're not, I'm sure they're not like, um, you know, oblivious to like uh, the like uh, cost of having like speakers break, you know. They're they're probably looking at long-term reliability when, they're make, when they make their speakers because as, as Matt just mentioned, it costs a lot of money to have to fix a product that's already been, you know, it's not cost effective. And, and these people are looking at their bottom line, so they're not making speakers that are made to break or, or fail, you know, because that would drive these. We all know about businesses where they, they had a prob, uh, product, problematic product that ended up sinking the business, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think Kali is, is uh, that... Um, short-sighted no, that they like, would build it looks like they're on the failure. right path with what they're doing here so let's wrap this up we got four speakers here we have four written reviews on audioholics.com i still have to publish the rbh one it might happen towards the end of the week um i'll actually put it up a few days earlier on our patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics if you guys want to become a member um matt james thanks for spending a sunday evening with us talking speakers and um don't argue too much when we get off this call now <laughs> uh we'll be fine <laughs> we'll argue we'll, just enough not too much exactly we we've been able to be friends for a long time and we don't agree on lots of things <laughs> yep i got gotcha. you well he is because... moving away from me toward you gene so just keep that in mind <laughs> i know i know You're I next, got, now I'm gonna... yep I, I can see that okay well, guys, I hope you like this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hit that bell notification. Um, thumb it up. Put some comments down below. Tell us what active speakers you'd like to see us cover next because we are going to expand this category since it's something very viable uh, to be pursuing for people to be using in the home theater environment as well. So, um, again, guys, thanks for being here. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. That was